wait for a red light over there. Welcome, everyone. My goodness, it really is cold out there, and thank you for coming in from the cold. Um, I think we're going to warm you up with some stories about Benjamin Farm. Um, thank you so much for coming. We weren't really sure what would happen to the crowd with the weather, and um, I think we have a very hearty Maine crowd here um, ready to bust out for spring. My name is Kathy Mills. I'm Executive Director of the Land Trust. Um, welcome. Um, it's hard to contain our excitement about what's going on at the Land Trust. We've had a very full year. We have a dynamite project ahead of us. I can feel the interest and energy in this room. People want to know what's going on, what's going to happen to Benjamin Farm, tell us about it, where are we going, what do we need to do. Um, we're here to share something about that with you here tonight. Um, I wanted to just start by saying that, um, and sort of take a page out of another book, you've heard the expression, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it also takes a village to do land conservation, big time. In one of our recent um, appeals, we talked about how Land conservation isn't the job of government or the private sector. It is the business of community. It's community members who come together with a local nonprofit, a small land trust like Scarborough Land Trust, that makes land conservation happen. That's the only way it happens, by working with people like you. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your support of the Land Trust and for all you're doing to protect the quality of life and quality of place here in Scarborough. Without further ado, I want to introduce Paul Austin, who's our president, who's pr been providing terrific, steady leadership through many ways this past year. Thank you. I was going to introduce myself, so that saves all that time. Um, this is the boring part of the speech. This is where we thank everyone and, and we name names and, and tell stories, but somebody has to do that. So, so I've been elected to do that. Some other people get to do the really fun part of the program. Uh, this has been a really big year. As you know, we have lots ahead with Benjamin Farm, but we're, we're running out of the gate and it's, it's going very well so far. So. Uh, you'll, hear, you'll hear more about what the stages are as we go along. We've got a lot of people who spend a lot of time doing land trust business and work, and I want to introduce some of them, some of them to, to all of you, just so you know the faces when you see them in Hannaford's or wherever. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tom Hall, who's here. Uh, Tom has been a, a great friend of the land trust, our, our town manager. Uh, we. We have a great partnership with the town, and Tom is, is one of the reasons one of the reasons we have that. I don't know that I see any counselors. Uh, I don't see anyone here as a counselor or any of our reps. Um, I'd like to. We have one order of business. Um, I'd like to introduce the board, and I'd like to have them stand, if they would please. Uh, We'll, we'll make Rick stand first, so he has to stand the longest. We have Rick Cheney, we have Jeremy Winterstein over there. Uh, Rick is the is Rick is the Rick is the <laughs> children children. Uh, Rick is the is the clerk for the land trust uh, and a, a lawyer, Drummond Woodson. Uh, Jeremy is is the head of the acquisitions committee and a tireless volunteer in all kinds of ways for the land trust. He has a, a private uh, conservation consultancy. I believe Patrick O'Reilly, who's our treasurer, is not here. Um, Elizabeth Peoples is in the back in the middle uh, raising her hand. Um, Elizabeth has been the project leader on the Benjamin Farm 
uh, the Benjamin Farm Project and has done amazing, amazing work. Um, she's a, a lawyer in private practice. Next to her is Mark Fallensby, another board member. Um, he is a toxicologist and travels all over the world for the company that he works for with the uh, salmon color, what color coat is that? Salmon color coat? Uh, Bets, Bets Armstrong, can you stand? Bets has a, has a, a cold today. Uh, Bets is one of our board members. She has tremendous experience with various boards in the, in the Portland and Scarborough area. And she is the, the chair for the uh, Benjamin Farm Fundraising Committee, which is, which is a major, major work. And Bets is, is torn into it like crazy and, and doing a wonderful job. Uh, Al Timpson, is he? Al Timpson is not here this evening. Um, and that's the board. Uh, the one, the one uh, bit of business that we have to do tonight is we have to, by our bylaws, we have to uh, confirm the board or vote the board in. And the way our bylaws are written at this point, if you are a donor to the land trust, you can vote for the board. So I'd like to make a motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that that uh, you accept the the board members that I've mentioned, and the and then at the next board meeting we will actually select the 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 actual uh, jobs that everyone does: vice president, treasurer, clerk, and so on. But um, so I guess I'd like to make a motion that the board slate be approved. And anyone who's a donor, if you agree, please raise your hand. And if you disagree, you may raise your hand. But it looks like we have way more hands raised than, than not raised. So um, we, have, we have, well, everyone is a volunteer except Kathy. So we want to recognize some volunteers. The board members are certainly volunteers. We have uh, three volunteers that we really want to mention. Um, we have our silent whirling dervish, Rita, Rita Breton. Rita, raise your hand. Um, Rita has pulled together all kinds of history on Benjamin Farm. She's made the sign boards that you'll see. She has managed the Broad Turn Farm Dinner for two years, and she's working with another volunteer this year, uh, although she'll be away, so she can't, she can't do some of the work. Um, Rita is always there for development, communications, and anything we want, and she never wants any credit for, for it, and that's why I want to give her some credit for it. Uh, Diane Neal is standing next to Rita with the green sweater. Diane is our stewardship, stewardship committee chair. Thank you. <laughs> stewardship committee chair, and, and Diane is, is doing a great job uh, hurting the cats. Uh, as we as we work on our stewardship, we have a lot of stewardship to do, and and we're we're doing it with volunteers at this point, um, and we're we're gradually chipping away at things. It's a it's a fairly slow effort, but we're we're making progress. And a woman named Dawn Piccolo is working with Rita to take over the Broad Turn Farm dinner this year. Dawn Dawn couldn't attend tonight, but I'll just say that I think Rita started. Rita and Dawn started working on this in January, and the dinner is in August. It is a major deal. We're having 200, we're, we're having 200 guests this year. Uh, we had 160 last year, and it sold out in two weeks, which is just unbelievable. And Rita has a notebook that's perfectly organized that's at least three inches thick that is, is just, in fact, it should be on display here tonight. It is, it is a thing of beauty. It's just amazing. Um, the year in review, uh, we know a couple of big things that happened. I want to talk about just some general things. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in tremendous detail, but we've had nature walks on all our properties this year. Uh, we had two that were very ably led by, by Superior Burger, Eddie Wooden, and did a wonderful job. We had one that was done by Kelly Boland, who's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Biologist and the New England Cottontail Coordinator. Um, we had one done by Jeremy at Libby River Farm. Um, and we've had, let's see, who did I miss? Someone. Uh, oh, a walk by Gil Paquette, who's a, a naturalist and scientist who's on our stewardship committee. Um, he led a winter walk at, 
at Frith Farm and Sewell Woods, which was which was very interesting. Um, as you know, last year we purchased the the Warren property on Payne Road. Uh, it's 156 acres. We uh, we received a, a substantial grant for wetlands restoration and and now a study on that property. We're in the process of of completing uh, a huge and onerous program that's required by those by those funds. We will be restoring some wetlands there, and we will be working on trails once that work is done. Um, we the the property isn't a, isn't officially open, but we have a trail that we're mowing there. Um, so if you want to stop by, um, you'll see the gated entrance and uh, next to pavement treatments on Payne Road, and you can go in and, and see that property. Um, it's wonderful in that there are amazing wildflowers and wild cranberries there, which I have never seen before, and the fields are just full of wild cranberries, and it's, it's really spectacular in the fall. Um, and in the spring, they're there and they're gushy. Don't eat them now. <laughs> um, we, we had two, uh, two major projects this year, one at Libby River Farm and one at Fuller Farm on Broad Turn Road. We did a bunch of mowing for New England cottontail habitat. It, uh, we're working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and we are mowing scrub areas that were very poor forest that regenerated poorly, and those will regrow as even tighter and denser brush, and that will be ideal habitat for New England cottontail. New England cottontail is an endangered species excuse me, a threatened species, and the state is working very hard, state and federal government are working very hard so that it doesn't become an endangered species because then that triggers a whole mess of regulations that are really onerous for anyone who has New England cottontails anywhere near his property. So we have actually three New England cottontail projects that we're working on on our lands, um, and part of that is is invasive plant control, letting the stuff regrow, and, and managing it properly. Uh, we're, we have new signage at all our properties in the kiosks, and we're working with Piper Shores to work on new trail signs. We're, we're uh, long overdue for a bunch of trail signs, and we're, we've got a great partnership going with Piper Shores on that effort, and it's, it's looking really good now. Uh, the our biggest event for the year is the Fresh from the Farm dinner at Broad Turn Farm that I already mentioned. It's an amazing effort by zillions, maybe zillions of billions of volunteers. It's it's a wonderful evening. It's a, a great get together, and the food is amazing. Um, Stacy and John at Broad Turn Farm get huge kudos for for helping with that, and Aurora Provisions, Leslie Osher. Is is just amazing in, in organizing that with John and Stacy, and we we couldn't do it without their help. And our goal this year was to raise money to replace the roof on the long barn. And if you if you've seen the long barn there and are familiar with it, you know that it is a huge roof. Uh, we met our goal uh, through Broad Turn Farm through the dinner funds and through other donations, we've met our goal of, of $40,000 plus to replace that roof, and that project uh, will be beginning this spring and be finished this spring, and we're really excited about that. That's really the last huge, tremendous project that we have to do in our 40 years of deferred maintenance at Broad Turn Farm, so we're pretty excited about getting this done. And of course, we started at the bottom, and we did the floor first, and then we did the sills and the walls, and now we're doing the roof. Um, it's just the way it worked out and, and not the way we really want to do it, but it's just one way to do it. Um, the big news, obviously, is the Benjamin Farm Purchase and Sale Agreement. We signed that at, at the end of December. We have until the end of December in 2014 to raise the, the money for the acquisition and project costs. We will be applying to the. Well, we have already applied to the land bond. That that process is in. Or that's in process. We are hoping for some public monies, and there will be um, a large private fundraising component. 
that's that's begun under under Betts and Kathy's uh, able ability, and you'll be hearing more about that. And there will be ways that you can can help us with land bond process and so on and so forth. So we we. We're just getting that all pulled together, and we're working on it very hard. And there'll be more. There'll there'll be more uh, about that as the year goes on. I think that's the. I think that's the the crux of what I wanted to say. Um, there's one. There's one thing that we'd like to we'd like to talk about a little bit. Um, could we have that slide wherever it is? Um, There, there are a number of ways that land conservation provides an economic benefit to a community. Um, one of the ways that, that it provides an economic benefit is that if a, a community has open space and parks and the opportunity for public recreation, the actual property values in the town are increased. So your house is worth more because it's in a town that has open land. Um, another way that, that conservation is an economic benefit to the town is that each residential unit built in Scarborough according to the 2000 uh, growth and services report that's the last firm number that I have but every house that's built in Scarborough costs the town of Scarborough $1,200 a year and that's why we want to have commercial and, and uh, industrial development in town because residential units don't pay for the services that they use. And those numbers are probably somewhat higher than $1,200 a year now. Um, last year, um, I started thinking about Broad Turn Farm. Um, John Bliss is here somewhere, way in the back. Stacy, I guess, couldn't make it. Uh, you, the, the land trust bought the Broad Turn Farm property seven or eight years ago. It's 434 acres. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful old main farm with continuous architecture, one of the few that exists in town. We, we had a public request for bids, and we selected John and Stacy out of a, out of a, a pool of, I think, eight applicants to to run a, a farm business at Broad Turn Farm. We couldn't be happier with John and Stacy. They're, they're very good businessmen, and they welcome the community and the farm, and there's a tremendous community benefit, economic, community benefit, both social and economic benefit to, to their business at the farm. They actually lease about 275 of the 434 acres we did a 30-year lease with them about a year or a year and a half ago, and that was a very long project and a very interesting project. I've mentioned it before, but we have to protect our interest in the farm, and John and Stacy, essentially, because they don't own the land, we have to provide them with some way to provide equity for them because they're, they can't just sell out when they want to retire. So it was a really interesting project, and and it's pretty much unique in the state of Maine. A bunch of people have, have contacted us about how we did it and what we did because it was a, it was a, a fairly forward-thinking project. But I started thinking about the farm as an economic engine and conservation as an economic engine. And I wanted to present some sort of a very graphic one-page paper um, to show what it's like. And I started doing numbers and talking to John and Stacy, and I found out that this was an astonishing, absolutely astonishing thing. And if you look at this chart wherever you can see it, um, you'll see up at the top the Scarborough Land Trust owns the property, 434 acres. Broad Turn Farm below that leases 275 acres. And what we've done is we've tried to figure out how many people benefit, how many people in the community benefit from this business and this conservation of Broad Turn Farm. And John and Stacy, as I said, are very, are very shrewd business people. Um, they're, they're very energetic and they try things and if they don't work, they try something else. And 
you know, the history of farms anywhere is that you you used your land to make money so that you could keep your land. And what John and Stacy are doing are the you know sort of the the modern version of what Benjamin Farm did when they raised cattle or they raised beef or whatever whatever was in market that's what or wherever the money was that's what they tried to to raise. Um, John and Stacy are in the 21st century, and what they're doing with their farm you'll see across the top below that line you'll see uh, the different businesses that they have at the farm. One of those is a community supported agriculture program where people pay up front and get vegetables all year, and there are 200 shares this year for the community supported agriculture program. So there are 200 people that invest in that. There's a farmland sublease to the Snell family farm in Buxton. Half of the land that the Snells till is actually at Broad Turn Farm, and John is always very quick to add that it's the best half of the land that they till. Um, they have a wedding business where they host 10 weddings a year. They put up a tent and have people come for weddings. They have a floral design business. They do flowers for three events a week on average. Uh, they have a farm stand that's not manned, but they have a star farm stand on the, on the property in the square barn. They have a hay barter with some neighbors, and they have a farm camp uh, where children come as a day camp for it's, it used to be 30, uh, 30 kids a week for I think eight weeks. It's it's morphed a little bit, but if you look at this chart and there are some of these in the back, what it does is it it tracks the number of people that benefit. I started to do money and found out that that was a little embarrassing because we were asking John and Stacy about money, which isn't really fair because they're a private business. But what we found out was that there are 81 people that derive a direct benefit, direct financial benefit that earn income from Broad Turn Farm. And there's a full-time farm manager, there are apprentices and interns, there are employees. Uh, the Snells employ 25 people or 24 people a year, so I just added half of their people uh, because half of their land is here. They're active in three farmers markets in the Portland area and, and Keystones for a couple of them. Um, the wedding business uh, has a huge number of people that come to that. The floral design business has a manager and employees. So we had 81 people that received a direct financial benefit from Broad Turn Farm. Those aren't full-time wages. Tom suggested that I try to do a full-time equivalent, and that's one of my next time next things. But but uh, it's a significant business in the town of Scarborough. There are approximately 760 customers that are the income stream for the farm. They're the CSA share purchasers. They're the leaseholder for the farm. They're the wedding clients. They're the floral clients. Um, they're the people who send their kids to the farm camp. And the direct benefit of people that directly benefit from the programs and the events are nearly, there are 4,935 people, nearly 5,000 people have a direct benefit from this farm. And this doesn't include wholesale vegetables, it doesn't include the roughly 1,000 people that come to each wedding, or that come to the weddings, it doesn't include where they stay, where they eat, where they buy gas, um, or where they shop if they go to Cabela's on the way home or whatever. So, so you know, this is this is a you know highest and best case of an economic benefit from conservation, but it's happening in Scarborough, and we're really really proud of it. So, and there, are, and thank you. And there are copies of this of this sheet in the back. There are some copies, and if anybody uh, can't get a copy and would like to look at it, you're welcome. You're welcome to do that. Uh, the fun part of the program is next. Um, I'm introducing Elizabeth Peoples, who's going to do a, a short program about Benjamin Farm. So thank you very much. Mark, can you tell me which button? We dinosaurs like to stand out.
thank you all for coming. Can you hear me? No? Is that better? Okay. This is an exciting project for the land trust and for the entire town and community. Uh, the for people, I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, know where the location is, but for those of you who don't, the road running uh, to the south of the Benjamin Farm is Pleasant Hill Road. Fog Road runs into Pleasant Hill, and that's where it is located. It's the east side of Scarborough. About 15 years ago in the 1990s, um, the then Land Trust President Lorraine Sedgley met and became good friends with Mr. Benjamin, who owned this parcel. Throughout their friendship, he often talked about how he wished this would be protected and preserved. He died in 2006, and his five children inherited the property. One of them is here, Kathy Perrault, with her husband, Jerry Perrault. Right, right here. And they've been extremely instrumental in getting us to the place we are right now, so I want to thank them. During the time that uh, we worked with the family, continuing communications, uh, Kathy and Jerry have been right there, making sure that if there were other people interested or other, other potentials, that they continued to stay open and working with us as well. This past fall, the family decided to sell the property to the land trust. Now the work begins. Sorry, I can't see this too well. Apologize. The farm is 128 acres. It's open woods, mature forests, and wetlands. This is one of the most scenic and beautiful views in the highly densely populated popular area, one of the most densely populated areas in the town, the Pleasant Hill area. It's one of the last open spaces in this side of Scarborough as well. It's a rare opportunity for us to have to be able to protect and preserve uh, this size land which is close to the ocean and beaches. Part of this property, the right side, abuts the Rachel Carson Wildlife Foundation, or Lee. It also abuts the town property, the Wiley Recreation Area. The significance of that is that when you have continuous, unbroken wildlife and wetland corridor, it promotes and it protects the wildlife diversity. We're thrilled to be able to have that happen. Across the street is the Libby River watershed as well, which runs down to the Libby River Farm off Black Point Road. In addition, this property is significant and important to our communities because the, there are aquifers on the property. making sure I have the right picture. Do I? <laughs> okay. Uh, what we're finding, and we're working with the historical society and some of the family members that uh, lived here, that their, their parents and grandparents were here, is that there were aquifers, mineral, and natural springs on the property. The aquifer is the tributary to the Spurwink River. This is important because protecting that will protect the quality of the marshes and the river itself, not just for wildlife, but recreation and also clamming and fishing. I mean, obviously, the marshes and the rivers here are a significant piece of Scarborough and Scarborough's heritage. The natural springs, there was one called the Never Ending Spring. And mineral springs, we're learning more about that, and Kathy will speak about that when she talks about the history of the farms. There's also a 
Oh, I'm way off. I'm sorry. <laughs> the slippery elm tree. This is a rare tree. If you go by the property on Pleasant Hill Road, you can't miss it. It's magnificent, it's beautiful, and it's strong. It's really incredible that it remains standing today. This piece of property represents Scarborough heritage. We're excited to hopefully preserve this for both the scenic views and what we hope will be public trails. It brings me back to the community which Kathy spoke about the village. We do see this as a community project. We can't do it alone. We're all volunteers. Community by community, I don't mean just the Pleasant Hill community, that's important, but also the community of people that come here year after year seasonally, that their families have been here for over 100 years or more, as well as just the people that come here from other areas of Scarborough, as well as the local surrounding communities for our beaches and the ocean, marshes as well. We look forward to it, and Kathy will speak to you about how uh, we can get involved. You can sign up, and also um, she'll provide you with the history of the property, or some of it, because we don't have it all. You can tell we're very experienced PowerPoint users up here, but we want to show you pictures and provide you with a little bit of information. so there's not much light up here at the podium. So, um, gosh, I didn't really collect all this information. I'm just the messenger. Um, so much has been pouring out on us about this property, and I'm going to try to give you a sense of what's been going on at the Land Trust since we announced um, our plans to purchase and conserve this property. Um, I want to just recognize a few people who've been so involved in putting some of the pieces together for us Number one is Rita, Rita Breton, who was recognized earlier. She has, she's an historian by training, and she is a, a lead volunteer at the Land Trust. And she has been putting together so many pieces, meeting with families, going to the Historical Society, doing detailed genealogy work that has been unearthing some really fascinating pieces about the Benjamin Farm property. I also wanted to mention briefly, just to embarrass her a little bit more, we, we really can't say enough about Rita. She really is a, a, a quiet tornado. Um, she received uh, just the other week um, a 2014 EcoMaine Excellence Award, one of I think about 10 or 12. And I just want to congratulate her and have everyone give her another round of applause. Beth Bellamere, who lives right across the street from Benjamin Farm, was also a huge source of information for the history, the Johnson family, whom I'll mention in a minute, and also the Robinson family. Rita pulled all this information together but wasn't interested in being at the podium, so I'm here to be the messenger. This property was farmed for about 150 years, up until 2006 when Mr. Benjamin died. And this is Mr. Benjamin. Gerard Benjamin. He grazed cattle on the property, but he did not live at the farm. And he owned the property for about 50 years. He had a building demolition business in Portland, which is now owned by his son. This is an aerial view of the property. We're not exactly sure when it was taken. We're thinking maybe in the 70s. But it's a, a stunning shot of the property when it was actively grazed by cattle. You can see the green grazing fields, the farmstead area in the front, um, just a, a stunning sweeping aerial view out to the spur wing. And is that called Pleasant Pond in the foreground across the street? Yes. 
which is behind Beth's house. I don't think there's anyone anywhere who knows, well, I won't say anywhere. Beth, is one, Beth Bellamere is, is one of the people who knows a lot about almost every square inch of that property. She was very good friends with Mr. Benjamin in his later years and uh, has been a tremendous source of information. Mr. Benjamin's cows, looking pretty happy. The brick farmhouse was really the iconic piece of the farm property. Um, it was built in an earlier iteration of a farm family, but it was on the property when Mr. Benjamin purchased it. It fell into disrepair and was, has been dismantled, but it was really a striking, really cut a striking profile on the property. When Mr. Benjamin died, his five children inherited the property, one of whom is here. And again, we've been working with them for quite a long time and particularly intensely this past fall to realize what was really Mr. Benjamin's dream to conserve the property and, and we're thrilled that his children have carried that on. Here's Mr. Benjamin hanging out with some great bales of hay in front of that beautiful brick barn. It is important for farmers to rest every once in a while. It's hard work as John can attest. And this is the, what's remaining of the farmhouse. Again, Mr. Benjamin didn't live at the property, and the building has fallen into disrepair. We, we will likely not be able to save it, but there is some history still, still remaining there to enjoy while it's up. It's really quite in, in pretty bad shape. So, um, so there's the Benjamin family, and then there's the Johnson family. Last fall, there was an article in the Scarborough Leader uh, that I think interviewed the family and the realtor and, their, and the Benjamin's interest in, in having the property conserved. And shortly after that article appeared, we got a CD in the mail with a note from Ron Johnson, who's sitting up front here. And it's a fascinating historic CD, which I'll play some excerpts of the full CDs in the back and it was playing a bit before before the program. But it took us a little while to get in touch with Ron. We were pretty busy, tied up with the transaction of the property. But when we got in touch with him, um, we learned that his dad is still living. That is Niels Johnson, his dad in the middle. He's 90-something years old, 92. He just celebrated his 92nd birthday. He's sharp as a tack. We called up Ron, and he invited us over to meet with him and his family and his dad, Rita and I and Elizabeth went over, and I cannot tell you, I think any historical society, th th there's just a treasure trove of history in that house, mint condition photographs, about the farm, mint condition photographs, old journals, old accounting ledgers of sales at the farm, and Niels, both Niels and Ron have tremendous um, information about farm and memories and data, again, just a treasure trove of information that came to us really by virtue of our publicizing our plans to conserve the property. So there's a slide missing here, I, th I thought it was included, but the, um, the property consists actually of three parcels. The easternmost larger parcel, there's a, a land formation called Beach Hill that, that's a rise on the property. And the Johnson family lived at Beach Hill Farm. This is a, a watercolor that is a picture that is over the mantle at Ron and Colleen's house in South Portland when we went to visit them. I mean, it was like walking into Benjamin Palace land, really, honestly. They were very gracious in, in hosting us and just a treasure trove of information. This is a photograph of that 
Farmstead. The farm was originally a dairy farm and then later transitioned into vegetables and cabbage was a, was a core crop and they sold to um, both the Portland and Boston markets. And like many good farms in that day and even other farms today, they harvested seaweed on the beach, in this case it was Higgins Beach, to provide fertilizer for their gardens. I remember when I worked up at the Nearing Homestead up the coast, folks said, oh yeah, the Nearings are really innovative, they use seaweed to uh, fertilize their garden, and I'm like, well, I guess there were other people doing this long before the Nearings came along. So that is, I believe, someone from the Johnson family, or Robinson family, I've forgotten now, who is harvesting seaweed on Higgins Beach for the farm at Beach Hill. So I mentioned this historic video, um, and it's a little dark up here. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to manage this, but I'll give it a try. So the video that Ron sent to us was done in the 1940s by, who shot that video? His father, Niels Johnson, Jr., and he narrated it. And I don't know if he had a script, but it's beautifully presented. Did somebody script him? Who it? Well, for somebody who won it, <laughs> um, it's just beautifully narrated. So I want to share with you a few clips. It's a little dark up here to see. Um, the timestamps that I picked to show you. This is Niels Johnson picking up the mail. The residents of Niels and Annie Johnson on the Pleasant Hill Road in Scarborough, Maine. Pull the leaves together and you look and when you find a head that's nice and white. Uh, now he's looking for a head to cut. Now there's a nice white head of cauliflower. It probably was al had already been covered. But there it is. Cut the leaves off of it, put it in the crate, it's ready to go. The lettuce is not, if the cauliflower is not white, uh, they won't be saleable in the store. Even though if they turn a little bit brown, it doesn't hurt the lettuce, uh, the cauliflower in the least, but it must be white in order to be saleable. Here's a whole bunch of cauliflower uh, all ready to be hauled to the, probably the local wholesaler in Portland either Hannaford Brothers or Cobb Brothers was the two that my dad. And it goes right in the middle of farming, farming, you know, the fire alarm. was also the home of Niels Johnson Jr. The barn you're looking at here is the barn that kept the cows and horses, a two-car garage, and another barn where all the hay was stored. Stage in the farm. 
process, but you cut the hay, the hay is cut and then dried in the field. When it's dry, you load it onto the truck or hay rack in the old days, haul this hay up to the barn and put it in the barn for storage for the winter for the cow and sell hay to others. This is my mother. She's apparently in the strawberry patch and Dottie is visiting uh, to help my mother pick strawberries. We sold some strawberries to the local people, didn't really grow them to any great uh, amount, but we had a few strawberries, of course, for ourselves. My mother did a lot of preserving. And of course, eventually, the cabbage grow. And when the cabbage grow, they have to be cut. So we go through the field and the field of each head, and if the head's nice and hard and solid, they cut it. If it isn't, they let it grow some more and they go back through the field again. Cabbage are, in this case, uh, uh, packaged in, in boxes or crates. Sometimes they're hauled to the store or to the wholesale house in bulk. Now Dad's coming up in the field with his little trailer and his little small walking because we plant a lot of the small stuff like spinach and lettuce and, and beets and carrots and uh, that's planted uh, with this planter, a little gasoline engine on it. You walk behind it and plants two rows to once. probably was already, had already been covered, but there it is. Cut the leaves off of it, put it in the crate, it's ready to go. The lettuce is not, if the cauliflower is not white, uh, they won't be saleable in the store, even though if they turn a little bit brown, it doesn't hurt the lettuce, uh, the cauliflower in the least, but it must be white in order to be saleable. Here's a whole bunch of cauliflower uh, all ready to be hauled to the probably the local wholesaler in Portland. Either Hannaford Brothers or Carr Brothers was the two that my dad. And last but not least, 1945. Of course, they're going to be setting on each other. Then you put them into the crates cover them with a waxy paper and staple that, uh, nail that paper on and, and then a big truck from probably from Boston comes here and loads on all the crates of lettuce and off they go to Boston. There's a lot, most of the vegetables are sold right here in Portland, but if you have more than you can sell locally, uh, then you call up a wholesaler in Boston and you say, how, how many can you take there? So that's just a, a glimpse of a few clips from this 1940s film. It's actually 20 minutes long, um, and I worked on a farm for a season and a half, as John knows, when he was managing a farm in Cumberland 10 or some years ago, and I've never seen a video that, um, from beginning to end, so clearly and simply and completely explains what it's like to work on a farm and what what. Um, what's involved from beginning to end. Um, it is on continuous feed up back and we'll be on again at the end of the program and um, we're going to look into, into the possibility of possibly um, posting this on our website somehow so folks can enjoy it. So that was the Johnsons. And that was the fall when uh, Ron Johnson got in touch with me, in touch with us last fall. 
So then another article came out about the property and our plans in January when we announced that we had signed a purchase and sale agreement. And the phone rang at the land trust, and it was 90-year-old Henrietta Robinson LaRue, who had a beautiful voice, again, sharp as a tack. She called to say that she was thrilled that we were preserving Broadturn Farm, excuse me, Benjamin Farm. We're going to be doing that a lot during this campaign, the bee farms at the Scarborough Land Trust. And she also lives in South Portland, where the Johnsons live as well. And we also went over to visit her. Rita and I visited with Henrietta and her sister, Belle. And just a few photos of the Robinson Farm, which was, on the, which was located on two parcels on the western part of the property. There is, um, let's see here. That is Henrietta LaRue on the right and her sister Belle Robinson Graney on the left. Very gracious hosts in their South Portland home and full, again, full of information about their time on the farm. The Robinson farm, I would say, was more of a, a gentleman's farm. This is a, a picture of it in the 1870s, Rita, of the original farmstead at the property. It was expanded. Uh, some dormers were added in the 1920s. And this is a picture of the expanded farmstead. Again, this is all, these are all piece, pieces of farm life that existed on the Benjamin Farm property. This is a picture of the Robinsons doing haying on their gentleman farm. They look like they're sort of dressed up in their Sunday best. I'm trying to sort of put that together with heavy farm work. Henrietta and Belle are the granddaughters of a Robinson, actually the great granddaughters of John Robinson, who first purchased the farm in the 1800s. 75 acres for $1,000, was it, Rita? Such great prices back then. And um, then his son, William, Char Charles, excuse me, Charles inherited it. And then his son, William, took it over. And Belle and Henri Henrietta shared memories of growing up in South Portland and going to the Scarborough Farm to play in the summer. Um, again, more information about the history of Benjamin Farm. They, they too, had roots at Higgins Beach. Um, they still have a couple of places there, but apparently years ago, the Robinsons had a cottage at Higgins Beach that was sold to Rodney Lawton, who owns the Breakers, and expanded that property to create the Breakers Inn that exists today. And when we were first working to describe Benjamin Farm and where it was, one of the things we wanted to do was say that it's not far from Higgins Beach, which is, which is the case. We had no idea that the property itself had roots at Higgins, that people in the past were harvesting seaweed from Higgins Beach to use on the property, and that other farm families there on the property had homes and summer places at Higgins Beach and, and real roots there. This is a picture of one of the Robinson ancestors with his horse Raven at Higgins Beach. So this is a big project for us. This is a, a a map, an 1871 map that Rita got from Scarborough Historical Society that shows the area. And in red on the right, it's hard to read on the screen, there's a spring on the property. There's several springs on the property, but one of them that, that was most abundant was called Never Failing Spring. And we've decided to take inspiration from the name of that spring. Since the Land Trust has been working for over 15 years, to try to conserve this property when conversations first began with Mr. Benjamin. And also, we have quite a big fundraising goal ahead of us. But there's such tremendous interest and support in the community for this project that we're just going to focus on never failing spring. We're in this for the long haul. We're optimistic about getting to the goal. And um, we're here to share with you so you can learn more about it and share it with people that you know.
I also thought this would be sort of a nice picture to end on. This is Ron Johnson when he was a toddler and his grandmother Annie on the steps of the farmhouse. And they're waving to someone, I'm not sure who, but I've decided that they are hailing us on for the Benjamin Farm property at Scarborough Land Trust. And I'm, I'm sure that Benj the, John the Benjamin family, of course, and the Johnsons and the Robinsons and their ancestors are, are cheering us on to preserve this amazing property that's beautiful, natural resources, but also has some amazing farm history in Scarborough. Thank you. Um, we'll take a few questions. I just want to mention that if you haven't already, please do sign the sign-in sheet before you leave. We're, we are going to take a few questions for people that might have them. But also, please be sure to sign our sign-up sheet and leave your email so we can keep you up to date on what's happening. We've just started. We're just out the gate. There will be lots coming up. We are going to be giving talks out in the community. Um, so the best way for you to stay in touch would be to leave us your email or address or phone number, however, however you stay in touch with people. Paul? I'm taking questions, <laughs> and I just found out about it. Um, any questions about the project or the property or the economic engine sheet? Yes, Peter. have a lot of steps to, to take before we end up owning the property, but we would love to have some farming, uh, some farming happen there. The fact that it doesn't have a residence makes it a little bit different, but we've discussed uh, ideas, for example, someone having cattle there, uh, the potential maybe for community gardens. Um, so we, we would love to. There's some very good soil on the, on the section of land behind the existing farmhouse. And there's also some good ag agricultural soils on the other side where the, where the uh, uh, Robinson farm was, where the old metal barn is now. So there is, there's definitely potential there. And, you know, because of our successes with Broad Turn Farm and our contribution to the success of Frith Farm, uh, we, would love, we would love to have some agriculture there. But it's a little early to decide how that's going to happen. Any other questions, please? Oh, there must be something. The, I'll just say that the video, the whole video is playing in the back on the counter. Um, please take a look at that. I think we're going to have to do something to show this video. We need to talk to the family and find out if we can. Uh, for example, I'd love to see it on the public access channel for a while. It really is fascinating. The narration is, is just wonderful, and it, it really shows a different way of life and a different time. It's a spectacular video. It is really a treasure. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to do clips, um, so we had trouble presenting that today, but it is absolutely a wonderful thing. So, yes? I would love to do that. And I want the first one. It's, it's just, if, if nothing else, the narrator's accent is, I can't, I'd love to know if that was really his accent or whether he or whether he hammed it up just a little bit for the video, but it is it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's great. Uh, any other questions? Any comments? Yes. Um I don't know. It's not our building yet. Um and and I'm not sure exactly it, I think we have to demolish it. I'm not sure exactly how that will be done. Um, I suspect it will be torn down rather than burned. Sure, sir. Did they operate that farm or was it next door? Oh, maybe they maybe they planted there, yeah. But the Okay. Okay, I didn't realize. Okay. No, that's good to know. I don't Yeah. No, thank you. No, I wasn't aware that that was part of Coltard Farm, so I just Any other questions?
questions, please. Kathy. Thank you. One, I have one. I want to take a straw poll. Uh, how many people think spring is coming? <laughs> I see two hands, three, four, four hands. I don't know. That's a little worrying. Thank you very much. There are refreshments in the back. There's a wonderful uh, picture board that Rita put together. Please walk around and say hello to everyone. Thank you very much.